Hi, and welcome to the SCS Packaging Webinar. Thanks for joining us. My name is Christine Bennis, and I'm the SCS Packaging Sales Manager. Joining me today is Kevin Cleary, who is our Eastern Regional Sales Manager. Say hi. Hey, hey. <laughs> and then we'll also have two of our R&D engineers, Rich Skinnis and Yen Wen, joining us a little bit later. So today what we're going, oh, let me talk about some housekeeping issues first. Um, as you can see, you are able to ask questions and we highly, um, you know, encourage those. We are going to do our best. We're going to break for questions midway through the webinar uh, to answer a few. And then at the end, if we don't get to your questions, we'll be sure to follow up with an email to get you the answers to what, the, what you're looking for. Um, your email was used to register, so we've got that contact information and we can respond that way um, after the call. So let's get started. Um, what we're going to talk about today is review some of the ESD packaging um, products that are out there on the market, um, what uh, is potentially available for you to use. Um, we're going to discuss static shielding bags, um, talk a little bit about Pink Poly, um, where where it fits in in, in the ESG packaging world, um, then dive into moisture barrier bags, uh, talk a little bit about the accessory items that work with that, and then um, Rich and Hien will come in and we're going to discuss a little bit more of the actual standards and testing that goes with those standards that we do here um, in our R&D lab in North Carolina. So to get started, um, static shielding bags are really the most widely used ESD protective packaging out there. There are other options, but um, bags are typically the way that folks go. Um, many, many different types, and we're going to dive into a little bit of them uh, uh, in a minute, but um, our 1000 series, uh, the metal inversion is typically the most popular. And then you get into other kind of um, applications uh, and films for that, like high puncture resistance, which our 1300 series would address, um, metal out uh, materials. Um, in addition to static shielding bags, moisture barrier bags have the same uh, electric uh, protection properties as a static shielding bag, but then offers uh, the moisture protection. And again, there's various different kinds of those. Um, out on our website, uh, and I will send out links after the webinar, we have an uh, extensive list of selection guides that breaks down all of the types we offer, uh, as we won't get a chance to dive real deep into most of them today. So as far as static shielding bags go, there's two main types of film structures that we, um, that we make and we offer and usually are used out in the market. Um, one is our metal end structure. Um, the metallized layer uh, of the material, which is what is needed to protect that shielding uh, property in the bag, uh, is buried in between layer of uh, polyethylene and polyester. Um, on the flip side, metal out structure, that metallized aluminum layer is on the outside layer. So it's going to give a very um, fast dissipative rate um, when it comes into contact with um, any kind of ESD discharge. Um, I know, Kevin, we get a lot of questions uh, in regards to where does pink poly fall into and, and why would you want a shielding bag uh, over a pink poly? Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about that um, for our viewers and, and give them some information on that. Certainly could, yeah. So so one thing is the, you know, the metal in versus the metal out. Mm -hmm. There's actually uh, a difference between the, the layers of the film. So metal in being a buried layer mm -hmm. uh, application and then metal out, that metal layer is toward the outer layer. It's a lot more conductive that way. Right. And so that's what makes it attractive to the end user. Um, uh, we're certainly set up today to discuss a little bit more about pink poly and metalized static shielding bags. Uh, that question comes up extremely often and uh, you know to get started uh, there's a visual difference between the two. Obviously the pink poly is a translucent or, or almost transparent uh, variety and then the metalized static shielding has that metal layer you know people call them shiny bags or uh, they're certainly not as uh, transparent. Um, pink poly is, is produced with a uh, extrusion process. The low charging attribute actually blooms to the surface. And uh, with that comes along the risk of this bag uh, losing its integrity a lot faster and it could certainly become uh, insulative. At that point, so for that, sorry to interrupt you, that, sure. there's definitely a shelf life for that then. That's not something that's a long term solution. That is exactly right. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, this, will, this bag will expire a lot faster. There's not an actual uh, rate on that, um, but it is a blooming process. So, it's certainly going to expire. And eventually, it'll be, it'll essentially become a standard poly bag, which we know right. is, uh, is not acceptable or not needed or wanted around uh, sensitive components. 
Um, yeah, so the static shielding bag, our metalized version of that, it's a, uh, it's a top coat. It's not an extrusion. It's not a blooming process. So it certainly lasts a lot longer. That top coat is known to last in the industry right. and, uh, and hold up against mm -hmm. uh, you know, the abrasions. Yeah. Maybe we could show them, I think we were planning on doing a demo, kind of showing the difference and, and, and how a discharge would be affected by both uh, different types of bags. Yeah, certainly. So today uh, we actually have set up, there's, there's two different meters that we'll use. Um, one being the uh, 718, it's our static sensor, it's a, a field meter. So using the field meter, we'll try to make sure we have a good view. Uh, if I use uh, any type of force or abrasion against a standard poly bag, you'll see here, I'm just going to charge this up with Tribo uh, charging. It's my hand against a uh, untreated plastic. And you can see almost immediately we get a thousand volts. That's a thousand volts on that bag, which as you can imagine, will just destroy a uh, sensitive component. If we go next door to that, uh, you know, we currently don't have, we have 0.03 volts. We can do that same charge method on a uh, low charge and pink poly. And we don't get a lot of activity. It stays around 0 0.03, 0 0.04. So, uh, you know, it doesn't charge, right? Static shielding would be the same way. We want to test that outer layer make sure that we're not charging up in any way to induce that into the atmosphere and we're good again. Now, the differences between uh, static shielding and pink poly come with the, uh, the electrostatic discharge shielding. So we want to make sure that if we're using a board similar to this, obviously this is an old board. It's got a lot of components on it and we don't want to damage any of those components if it were a new board. So we would, uh, yeah, we would, we would protect that with uh, an ESD shielding bag in that Faraday cage. If I put this board inside of a pink poly bag, will it protect it from ESD static discharge? Well, this is a way to find out. So I'm going to simulate using the EMI. This is an ESD event detector. I have a uh, conductor and I have some metal screws that's going to make some action. And with a quick pass, you'll see we have 163 volts with 17 events, 17 events. I can clear that out. We'll show that again real quick. Four events, 168 volts. So what happens when we put that uh, same measuring device in a pink poly bag? So about a standard, you want to put it in the product. You want to fold that over so that you make sure that you're completely protected. And if you'll watch the screen as I engage any type of activity you're getting reading. So I'm reading from behind, but 190 volts, we'll put that up close. 190 volts, we had 33 events that made it through that pink poly bag and onto our sensitive uh, device. So let's do that same test in a static shielding bag. So we'll clear the, uh, the screen. We're back at, at zero, zero volts, zero events. We'll place that into a uh, static shielding bag, metalized. Once again, we'll, we'll put a fold in that, so that way we're closing that Faraday cage up. And uh, by standing that up with the antenna in the direction again, we'll shake vigorously. And there is zero events that are passing through uh, from my uh, you know, ESD device or, or, or charge device model into that instrument. So. Um, it's just a real good visual to show the actual protection. Um, when your component is in a static shielding bag, then you're certainly protecting that. And uh, obviously the standards are written in accordance to that as well. So they recommend that you uh, use a static shielding bag in the EPA. And, uh, and certainly if you're going to transfer any components outside of the EPA or uh, to an end user. So that's kind of, that's our visual demo of static shielding versus pink poly. Yeah. Definitely gives a clear picture of you know what type of applications and, and what kind of situations you want to use that. If you're if you've got a, an electronic sensitive device, bare board type of thing, definitely needs to be in a shielding. 100% correct. Yeah, I think we proved that yeah, uh, outright. Definitely. All right. Well, let's move on. We'll talk a little bit about moisture barrier. And again, with moisture barrier, there's different types, um, different materials. Um, packaging or made to different specs. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is our aluminized low barrier or general kind of packaging that's good for general use type of situations. Um, we've got both the Dry Shield 2000 and then the high puncture resistance option on the 27 series. 
Um, we then get into um, our foil or our high barrier. Mm -hmm. um, those options, can talk a little bit about the difference between those two, um, the foil, um, high barrier and low barrier. Certainly, uh, yeah, so high barrier and low barrier, they're both moisture sensitive uh, or moisture protection involved right. in that. Uh, our high barrier is, uh, we choose a foil base, but it has a higher MVTR, which mm -hmm. is a 0 .0003. And those are caught out by uh, some of our JDEX standards and some of the higher uh, standards that are out there in the market. Low barrier is still a great uh, MVTR. It's about 20 times the uh, amount of a static shielding bag. So right. if you go from a static shielding to a you know entry level low barrier, you're getting a no, lot of MVTR there. So it works for for some people. Yeah. Um, and then our high reliability or uh, you know less than 100 or 50 or high corrosion atmosphere. Right. You know, if you're trying to protect all that. Um, then obviously you want to go to the high barrier and use that um, you know, JEDEC requirement. Sure. Speaking of JEDEC, um, which is really a standard that was uh, developed around the surface mount device industry, mm -hmm. but applies to even more than that, um, kind of addresses the bags, um, the whole system, the humidity indicator cards, the desiccants, the labeling, um, all of those go into a dry packaging system. I think we have some examples of those just to kind of show everyone. Yeah, we did. I think they're over there. Sorry about that. Right. Yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah. So it's definitely that's okay. It's definitely a uh, you know it's a total system. When you put all three together, Christine, what it does is allows you to uh, if there's any moisture that's left in the mm -hmm. on the component, the desiccant will absorb that while you're transferring the device. Once you've uh, you know pulled vacuum and sealed that in, uh, you're you're not only keeping the uh, the the level of moisture that's in that packet at the same rate. But you're also protecting anything from you know intruding into that package. And then the HIC card pretty much just uh, it assures the end user when they get that device and it's in a vacuum sealed moisture barrier bag, they know what the exposure That's level right. was. So it's certainly the, the best solution in a package deal D. I think we have some examples over there, some different looking bags, just to kind of show here are some moisture barrier bags that we make. Um, one of the things, because we're vertically integrated, we make our own film here and convert them into bags is that we're able to do custom applications. Um, kind of like this, this is a uh, tamper resistant type of bag where a product can go in the middle and in the bottom and then be sealed. This is our, we call it our origami bag, <laughs> our gusset bag. Um, don't have a lot of time to talk about all the capabilities we do. I think that's a good uh, subject maybe for another webinar. Um, we'll talk about that. But again, we have various options on the moisture barrier um, and a great selection guide out there so that we can get that out in your hands to, to review if you need it. So I guess we're gonna stop right now and take some questions. Let me see if there are any. All right, I got a question. Can you reuse shielding bags? Yes, so, uh, to a point. Right? Yeah, so that's, a, point. that's a great question. It we looks hear like it's probably not. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it's never recommended. Uh, you know, it's never recommended to reuse a right. static sensitive or static shielding bag or any of the bags uh, simply because you don't know no. what has been, uh, you know, uh, punctured or right. if any of the attributes have, have worn no. out. And the only way you'll know that would be to retest. So if you're going to reuse a bag, you need to then you certainly need to have retest and solid in your process. And right. if you don't, then I wouldn't trust it. Yeah, agreed. All right, let's see what else uh, kind of ties into that. Is there a shelf life for bags, even unopened bags sitting on the shelves? Is there a shelf life for them? Yeah, so there, there definitely is a shelf life. Uh, you know, we, SCS warranties for 12 12 months right. in the standard storage uh, condition. Um, so the shelf life can certainly go way beyond that. Uh, it all depends again on the storage condition. If it's extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, you may have you know what your atmosphere for storage is and whether the package has been open or not. So for an overall shelf life, again, it really gets down to test, test, test. test. Outside of the 12 months in the standard storage, you just have to test it on your own and be sure and if you have any questions, then obviously we can test that uh, yeah. for you. Yeah, and Richard's coming it. over. We're going to talk a little bit about that thing. That's a perfect intro. Thank you, Kevin. Exactly. <laughs> All, All right. right. Thanks. Here comes Rich. So Rich. Come on, you're in the hot seat now. I'm in the hot seat. You now. are. Everyone, this is Rich Triskinis, who is our senior R&D engineer here in our North Carolina Research and Development Lab. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So we're, today we're going to talk a little bit about the standards and then um, what we do here, what you guys do here uh, mm -hmm. specifically, and some options even for virtual testing. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so as far as industry standards, S541 is the main standard out there that kind of encompasses all of ESC packaging options, not just the bags, but some folks use right. conductive 
inductive fins, mm -hmm. totes, that type of thing. Um, I would say that we're, uh, and our bags meet that, but we are also meeting S11.4, uh, which correct. is your Bible, as that's, you told me before. That's our Bible. That <laughs> yeah. So for that, what, what are typically, what are you testing for within that standard that we have to meet here in the lab? Okay, when I get a, uh, a competitive sample or one of our uh, uh, bags off mm -hmm. the line, first of all, we test for the optical density uh, that would tell us if it's low metal, then it's a good chance it's not going to pass the shielding test. Mm -hmm. uh, then we put the uh, bags into our humidity chamber. A lot of these tests are run at 12% uh, humidity and 50% humidity mm -hmm. and 23 degrees <laughs> C. And while those are being conditioned for uh, uh, surface resistance and shielding testing, we'll chop them up and do uh, seam strength. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times we'll get bags that uh, have very poor seam strength. So if you put something in it, the right. bag can possibly uh -huh. open. Uh, we'll do pencil strength. And one of the really major uh, physical tests we do is puncture resistance. Well, that's great because we, we had talked and Hien is actually going to do a demonstration of the test that we do here on puncture. And uh, let's see if we're moving the camera over to her right now. One of the questions, and Hien, while, you, while we we're getting your tree up, there you are. Um, why is puncture resistance important? I mean, what, what's, what's the potential uh, downside if we didn't do that test and didn't meet the standard? Yeah, very good question about that. Like the reason why puncture resistance is really important is because there are many times that our bad user might drop or insert a sharp object into the bag mm -hmm. and it will like potentially compromise the bottom of the bag or the right. bag itself. Definitely don't want things dropping on the floor. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so high puncture resistance material are designed to prevent those incidents happen. And I think our um, Siri from 1300 is a really good example of high temperature shooting bags that we have. Correct. So let's go over the test that we do in the lab. So right here I have the uh, Instrum Jerusalem that we do for the test. We also have a picture view to hold the pin for testing. And this test is done for a new standard of 2010, test method 2016. Five called temperature resistance. So I have everything set up here, and all I do is just when I need to start. We're watching the graph, right? That's the important. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see right here that the temperature resistance is really high. And uh, normally, to have a good style of data. Uh, we're probably going to do pain, at least pain sample. Okay. Great. Now, Rich, you and I have talked and you were mentioning about shielding, right? Obviously, Correct. we do shielding. That's important. Um, and we do that here in the lab. But one of the options we also have to do is by doing it virtually. Um, we can have customers send samples and do a virtual meeting to show them yep. how their bags are truly performing and then obviously follow up with a written report. Um, what I'm going to do right now is show how we do that with our portable bag shielding tester. Um, as you can see, um, the, it's going to be graphed here on the screen. We've got the bag sample here. It's under a five pound weight. We're going to induce uh, energy into it. And per the standard, it needs to be less than 20 nanojoules, correct? Correct. For, right. uh, for the Bible. For the, per the Bible, yes. <laughs> so what we're going to do is do this. I'm going to induce this discharge. And watch the graph, that's what you're looking for, is this graph right here to see what it does. It's a slight movement. This is a bag that came in at 6.8 nanojoules, so well within the limit. Yes. Correct? So let's do some other samples. We've got some other samples that have been sent in from some of our customers to do testing because they don't know exactly what they have um, and want to make sure that what they're using is per the standard. So what I'm going to do is insert this bag here, back to five pound weight. 
reset the test. And ready, set, go. What do we see there, Rich? A failure. A failure. <laughs> let's see if I, I need my readers, but let's see. It doesn't, it doesn't even register. It's way off there. So it's way above that 20 manageable limit. So what could be causing that? I mean, I mean, obviously the bag's been used. That's yeah, one thing. But what else could used. it be? Like I said before, it could be low metal. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is low metal. Oh, so the, you've done uh, other testing on the sample. Yes, I did. Okay. So the, the density of the metal is density lower metal than what normally the, you would uh, Or the transmission. Okay. Light transmission okay. uh, was higher than the than the Bible uh, <laughs> Bible specification. Also, if the if the fold gets compromised, uh, it gets creased too much and sure. the metal breaks. Mm -hmm. yeah. That will that will cause that will cause that too. So just to reiterate, this is something that we can do um, on site. Um, typically, we need to do six samples, eight by ten samples is what the test requires. Correct. Or, at, you know, during these times, if, if customers want to send samples in, we can do it, schedule a go-to meeting, and then review um, how their bags are performing. So, thank you. Thank you for helping me with that. So, see here. So, just to kind of follow up. Um, just to, the bag or the box? So just, uh, one thing I wanted to show is the test data report. Uh, we, we do the testing here, That's correct. but we also provide a written report to the standards back to anyone that wants our test data. So this is kind of an example of, of what they would receive, part of what they would receive. It's correct. more than one page. <laughs> so just to kind of sum up, um, we provide, SES provides quality product that meets all industry public standards. Um, we test every bag. I actually worked out on the bag line yesterday. Um, to get some uh, knowledge, and we did for sure test every 500 bags. Um, we have local support out there, um, whether it's in the field with our manufacturer reps, our regional sales managers, um, and then we have our inside team um, and product management team that can provide years of, of experience and support. Um, we have many different films that are qualified here. They're made in the US and stocked here in North Carolina that ship out in three days or less. Um, being vertically integrated, I mentioned about the customs. Um, pretty much anything you can do with a bag, we can do it here. Um, so, so anything out of the box that you have, bring it to us. We'll be happy to see if it's something that we can do. Um, let's check and see if we have any more questions. Um, let's see. Can the surface resistance properties fade after time on static shielding bags? I think we talked about that a little bit ago. Certainly, certainly yeah, certainly that, it time. always comes down to uh, the use, but uh, abrasion will certainly make that, uh, you know, reduce the amount of surface resistance on the, the top level mm -hmm. or the interior level. So uh, it, it takes a lot to make that move on a metalized static shielding bag, a lot more than it would on a pink poly. Right. Um, however, it can diminish over time. So okay. that's why we stand strong on there's no reuse or Correct. avoid reuse. Avoid policy. reusing, okay. And here's an interesting question. Can the bags be reused? Or I'm sorry, not reused, re recycled. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so uh, there, there's a yes and a no there. Yeah. If you have a, a location that has standard recycle guidelines, our metalized bags are a mixed use, so they won't uh, apply to your standard uh, outlet for recycle. However, uh, we have and several users have found ways to, to recycle that product. Right. One example of that is they can, uh, they can grind that product down and uh, they can melt that and turn it into other items. Some of them mulch them up and turn them into, uh, you know, recyclable pallets. So, yeah. yeah, they can certainly be repurposed. Uh, recycle is, is a little tricky because it's a mixed metal um, yeah. bag. So I guess the thing to say is just call your local recycler, see what they take. If not, certainly. And if you have any questions, I have some avenues on that as well. Right. So locally, yep. we've already established that. So I would be glad to share what we've done yeah. here locally. Yeah, that's one of the things where, yeah, we try to be as green as possible here. So that's helped us out quite a bit. So, alrighty. Well, I think that's all we've got time for right now. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we will respond with any questions that we didn't answer and get back to you on those. And if we can help you in any way, let us know and look forward uh, to maybe uh, future webinars with you. Um, talk about some of the other capabilities that we have. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.